So, my name is James Bensley. Uh, don't worry too much about who I am. Uh, all you need to know is that basically I work for an ISP. People pay us to route packets around our network, and most of the time we get round, you know. It's a revolutionary idea that will never catch on. Um, also, I just have to point out that some of the things that I'll be saying are not strictly the views of my employer. Um, <laughs> see if you can work them out. If, if, and if uh, you happen to be one of our vendors, I'll try not to name them all explicitly. Uh, if you're one of our vendors and you're in the room, it's nothing personal. And also, the, uh, one more thing. This was, this was like a 40-minute talk I gave a little while ago. I haven't got time to do the whole talk now. and go as quick as I can. So if you miss some of it, you can get the slide decks, see me afterwards. I'll be at the beers later on. I like talking about this so much, I'll even buy you a beer. Okay? Stuff about us, we root packets, blah, blah, blah. Um, so nothing is really what it seems. I work for an operator, which means we buy equipment from a vendor. The vendor says it will do a million billion packets a second. Great, and it's within our price region, so we deploy it, and we tell our customers, this is, you know, we sell them circuits that does a million billion packets a second for an amount of money that they're happy with. But that's like basically never ever what happens. You know, everyone sells DSL as up to a speed, or anyone that buys a fiber circuit, you know, you're not gonna bring it into operational acceptance without having a, you know, an OTDR test, this kind of thing, you know. Things rarely work exactly as advertised. You know, you start turning features on your router like NAT, QAS, ACLs, and the packets per second performance drops right out. And would you know if like, there's an unknown ether type value in your packet header, the router crashes. Brilliant. Um, so there's a load of problems that we have. And I would loosely summarize this as the boxes that we buy from our vendors are basically black box devices. I've got no idea how they work. You know, the hardware is a secret to the vendor. The software is a secret to the vendor. Uh, so this is, this is terrible, basically. Not knowing how our devices work is, is pretty crap. We've had like <laughs> a load of bugs and you know, the worst kind of bugs as well. You know, we've had core meltdown in the middle of the day on a weekday, you know, that kind of stuff, because bugs with vendors. And you know, we tried to catch them in the lab. The vendors tried to catch them and stuff. People come up with the usual tagline that we can't test everything. I don't believe that. Um, so there's two things. The boxes are black boxes, so we don't know how they work. When it comes to troubleshooting them, you need stuff like TAC assistance, you know, JTAC, CTAC, whatever your vendor is. Um, you know, we have things, they're like hidden commands that we don't have access to. That's not very helpful. If you sell me a box and then don't allow me to like maintain and troubleshoot it myself, that's, that's a bit of a crappy deal, right? Um, so yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm you know, a bit of a skeptic. Take the approach. If you haven't tested it, it doesn't work. You know, fail safe. If you haven't tested it, it doesn't work. Just assume it doesn't work. Not even with brand new features, you know, old features, but you get a new software version, there's going to be regression bugs. And it's in hardware and software and this, and this kind of thing. Um, but like I said, people come to me and say, we don't have time to test it, or we can't test that in the lab. You know, there's two major issues there. And what we end up is with this scenario, where we have something like Schrodinger's router in the middle. And we have no idea how that router works. And we put a tester on each side, and we have no idea how the testers work. And what happens is, the tester on the left, we press go, and it says number of packets sent, and that goes from zero to one. And the one on the right, that says number of packets received, and that goes from zero to one. So it must work. That must be exactly the same packet that came out of the tester through the router and into the receiver. You know, and, and, and everything worked fine. You know, this is, in my opinion, this is, this is, pretty, this is pretty rubbish. Like, that, that doesn't, to me, really say it works. It says that this box, you know, the device on the left can display a one, and so can the one on the right. And you know, if I look on the router, there's sort of packets received and packets sent. The router is also capable of displaying the numbers zero and one. So it probably doesn't work. And you know, there's, there's, these are all links that you know you guys can sort of get to in your own time about at different levels. So like, there's a really good talk from someone at uh, Fastly from a previous Nanog meeting. He's talking about you know a switch vendor said that their switch will hash to 256 ECMP destinations. They loaded it up with 256 traffic flows. Actually, more than 50% of the traffic hashed into less than 50% of the buckets. Um, so it doesn't work. Um, an issue that popped up recently that, that actually affected us, so like the bug, the name of the bug tells you the vendor is Cisco. Um, a regression bug. You know, software update, and now there's cache miss on the MPUs, and just like that, we've got 33% performance decrease you know, on throughput on the MPUs. Oh, thanks very much. 
And like, that's a really easy bug that someone could have tested. Like, you know, 33% performance hit. That's, you, just, you just put a traffic generator in, send the traffic around, see that it's less. That's terrible. And the same with the hashing ones. It's not difficult to generate a whole bunch of flows and then see that half the buckets are empty. Like, this is rudimentary stuff. And, you know, and there's other things, you know, things like, you know, we do loads, you know, we do loads of pseudo wires and this kind of thing. You know, in 2007, it was highlighted that pseudo wires, uh, it's very difficult to scale them out across your backbone. You know, you can't hash them very well. You know, and now, oh, I wrote these slides at the end of last year, so it was 2017 then. People are still writing drafts to kind of correct this problem 10 years later. So, uh, yeah, so those are kind of, I would say, vendor issues. You know, bugs, you know, bugs in the code and bugs in the hardware, this kind of stuff. <coughs> I work for an operator, but the issues for the for, you know, for an operator is still um, you know, still plentiful. Let's say, is it like here's, here's an issue that we have that probably most operators in this room have, and you either are not monitoring it or don't know that it happens. Um, which is an example is where Ethernet packets have a CRC on them. You know, if anyone doesn't know, so a packet travels along the wire, be it fiber or whatever, and look, there's a mouse, and. Uh, if there's some, some interference, for example, the Ethernet frame arrives at the destination device, you know, there'll be a bit error, double bit error, whatever. The destination device sees that the packet is flawed, it is with error, uh, and the packet is dropped. But what happens when the packet, actually, if the packet has, you know, is unaffected, there is no errors, the packet comes into destination router, the CRC is stripped off, but then the packet travels through the router without a CRC, and on the egress interface, a new CRC is calculated and pushed on. So the points spent in the router, if you have, and this is not uncommon, people have like corrupted memory modules and this kind of thing, you know, that goes unnoticed. The packet gets to the egress router, a new CRC is written, and it carries on, and now it's got an error in it. And you won't know that until it gets to the very end host. You know, something in the payload was mangled. Only the end host will know that. It's very difficult to track this problem down. Um, most vendors have no counters that expose this. Most NMS software does, you know, hasn't got a way of like polling this or checking it and this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, you sort of end up with this sort of scenario where packets are actually protected during the course they're on, on the wire, but then not during the course that they're actually traveling through a device. And yeah, as an example, Cisco exposed this MPU counter, Juniper exposed this one. Um, so there are many issues, and obviously all the ones I've given as examples, these are like low-level issues that happen either on the wire or the lowest levels like Ethernet and MPLS. And that's kind of where my focus is for testing those lowest level issues because they kind of underpin everything else, you know. I don't know about you guys, but we have virtually no other protocols, you know, apart from Ethernet at the lowest layer and MPLS above that and that kind of thing. Um, so things, things, things right at the bottom are still quite broken um, and it's really difficult for us to test them. The boxes, you know, the, the vendor devices are a secret the testing devices are a secret, you know, how it all works, how they actually check that something did work or didn't work, you know, and we've been looking into this problem and there's not a huge amount of tooling, like free and open source tooling that we can use to kind of address the issue. So that's the kind of problem, this is the conclusion that we came to. Um, so yeah, I've been focusing mostly on, on how to test Ethernet and MPLS forwarding issues, basically, because that underpins 99% of our traffic and probably for loads of other operators in this room as well, if you're running you know, MPLS backbones and stuff. Um, so only network devices have been in scope. I don't really care about people's end devices because that could be basically anything from a BGP-enabled toaster to a smartphone. Um, we need to develop some standards-compliant testing. RFC 20544 is a bit old, but it is fairly ubiquitous. Um, obviously, I, the ITUT is a more recent standard, still not perfect, but the point is there are some standards, people are using them, um, but mostly with these very, very, very expensive testers that are also, that are also closed source, and I don't really know how well they test anything. Um, so we want it to be open source, and, you know, and additional extras would be free or low cost, and then vendor neutral. That's kind of what we want towards. Uh, and there's some bits there about there are actually additional uh, RFCs that have come out in more recent years about actually specifically IP version 6 benchmarking and NPLS benchmarking and stuff. And for those that don't know, there is actually an ITF working group especially for benchmarking. Um, so we want to kind of actually long term look at those, but in the short term, focus on RFC 2544 and the 1564 standards and see what we can do there. So we looked at a few open source tools. There are some great open source tools that I think not many people know about. 
um, and they should know about. Um, and kind of that's a, that's a rough overview. Don't know what happened to the E. Um, so you know, starting at the top, T Rex. If anyone doesn't know, open source product by Cisco. It will do hundreds of gigs of traffic generation, and it provides very very complicated features. It's not just about blasting traffic. It does HTTP requests and DNS requests, you know, at millions of packets per second spread out across. You know, if you've got a thousand web servers, that's fine. It will test them all simultaneously. It's very high performance, but very very complicated. You know, at the bottom of the stack, there's a program called Etherate, which is extremely basic and very easy to get going with, let's say. And others in the middle. Um, so I'm a quick look over them. Etherate, it's actually a tool that I wrote, but don't worry about that. Um, it's what I would consider to be like, the only way I can describe it is like iperf, but for Ethernet. You just, you know, if you run Linux, it probably works for you, um, and it just runs. It's just dead easy command line, you know, CLI options, just like iperf, you just specify like, an interface and some other options, and just start sending traffic. And you just run a sender and receiver. And so now at layer two, we can start sending different traffic. You know, iperf lets us do wonderful things like different IPs and different TCP and UDP port numbers. But actually, sometimes we need to go a bit lower than that because other devices try to be clever and you know, look at the ether type and then look at the IP version and then look at the high level protocol stuff and you know, hash on that information or do DPI. And we don't really want that. So this is like an easy way to generate traffic at layer two. Packet gen, um, which is DPD case. Uh, I'm just going to assume that everybody knows what DPDK is. If not, it's a library that lets you write very high performance networking software and is open source. Um, and so packet gen is kind of the opposite to Etherate. Because it uses DPDK, you have to use a DPDK supported NIC and you know, supported hardware. So that's kind of a bit of a downside. The plus side being if you use a supported NIC, it will, um, it will scale into the hundreds and hundreds of gigabits per second. Um, so. And then MoonGen is, is what I would consider somewhere in between. MoonGen also uses DPDK, so you've got this hardware limitation. Um, but packet gen is, 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 is kind of like, it's sort of CLI, mostly CLI based. You can script some stuff with Lua, but it's, you know, a lot of it rolls around the CLI. MoonGen is, only, is an only scriptable packet generator, parser, consumer, etc. cetera, um, when you write Lua scripts to control it. And we use DPDK so we can generate, again, millions of packets per second, thousands and thousands of concurrent um, flows. Um, you know, the downside being that you have to learn some Lua. And there's a sort of rough comparison of the different options there. Um, and the reason I picked up those programs is not just because they're like high performance, it's also because they all give you access right down to the NIC and the Ethernet level, That's which is where you want to go, like at the lowest level we can, we want to be able to manipulate the traffic. Um, so as an example, this is really hard to tell because of our fruit pastel coloring scheme. Um, but what basically happens is we send, you know, we, we're testing on these switches, some Cisco switches, how fine-grained the bum filters are to filter broadcast, unicast, multicast traffic. They'll let me set up a filter that's down to like 0.01%, which is quite accurate, you know, to be counting traffic coming in every single port that accurately. And that seems like quite a big deal to me, so we should test that. So, you know, we just set some random limit, in this case, 0.25%, um, and it's a 100 meg link, so we need to send 0.25 megs of broadcast traffic, which we can do with Ether8 just on the command line. Um, which if you're doing like 15, 14 byte frames, it's actually about 0.24 uh, megs, but it's fine. That's what it says. Current 0.24%. Right, so that, that actually works exactly as we expected. But I kind of, you know, most people haven't really tested that kind of thing. Yeah, most people just kind of configure bum filters and then they probably do work or they don't. Um, again, fruit pastels. Um, in this example, we wanted to basically test um, that a switch, again, another 2960, would pass every single kind of ether type in an ethernet frame. There's kind of no reason to do that. You know, we, almost all our traffic is gonna have one of a handful of ether types on it for MPLS, for IP version four, or IP version six. That covers 99% of the traffic that flies around our network, probably 99.999, right? So there's kind of, in a way, there's kind of not really a need to test that the switch does pass every single ether type. But the thing is, if, a cus if I sell a customer a pseudo wire and then he actually has his own made up protocol for his own made up application and it uses the ether type 1234, there's no reason why that shouldn't be passed through just because it's not you know, approved by IANA. It should just go straight through. The switch should just look at the source MAC, look at the destination MAC, MAC switch the packet through. So you know, in this case, we wrote a moon gen script. It generates packets with every single possible ether type, sends them through the switch, you know, back into the, the, you know, the, the NIC, and then once you see which ones are missing, and lo and behold, we dropped about 1,400 different ether types, and uh, 
it's a bit kind of complicated to go into now, but they were mostly, um, mostly 802.3 Ethernet instead of Ethernet 2 <laughs> frames. But we dropped a couple of other ones. Like we dropped uh, so eight, hex OX8100. We dropped this Ether type, which is for, for tagged frames. The port is actually set to, to, you know, it's a switch port access. It takes untagged frames. So it shouldn't really be looking at paying any attention to the fact that the Ether type is 8100. Although it's kind of, pretend, you could arguably, arguably uh, incorrect. I would expect actually that Ether type to go through. It's not a tag port. Uh, and the same for hex uh, 888E. You know, we're not running EAP on that port, so I would expect the frames to go through. There's no reason for the switch to actually pay any attention to that Ether type if we haven't got that configured. Make of that what you will. Oh, yes, and there was another actually interesting point. If we actually do this, with, for example, we blasted load traffic in with the Ether, ether type 8100. The actual the interface shows zero packets input, and there's about 65,000 packets as, as runs. So actually, it's not registering on the stats properly that the traffic even came in. So then actually now we need to go back to the vendor because this is a potential attack vendor. We can just start shoving traffic into the switches and it doesn't even show on the counters. Um, so, you know, same at the bottom. When we actually sent the EAP frames in, it shows 65,000 packets input, but they didn't go anywhere. They all just got dropped and there was no errors, drops, runs, discards, etc. So again, the switch is not really counting those packets properly you know, because they, they evaporated. They never came out the other board. So you know, these kind of things... You know, in my opinion, all of this needs to be like rigorously tested because I'm quite convinced that vendors just, you know, in my opinion, are quite lax with the way that they actually do, do their internal testing. And most people I spoke to agree with that, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> um, another example where we're testing this against an ASR 9001. And uh, this time, 8,500 different ether types weren't allowed through the... the uh, the device, which again, you can argue they shouldn't be allowed for it, but I, I'm not sure what, why that is. Um, but at least Cisco gave us, uh, actually, they exposed an NPU counter to us so that we could see what's happening. Um, oh, and another, another example. Um, so what we kind of came to at the end of that was that basically we have had a little look, you know, hardware, black box, testers, black box, you know, software that runs on them, black box. Uh, and we kind of came to the conclusion that the way we're testing things was a little bit like using the ADE 651. Which, if anybody doesn't know what that is, that was a bomb detection tool that the UK sold to the Middle East that was what you see in the picture there. It's a piece of plastic with a piece of metal sticking out. It has no functional parts or does anything at all. So that's pretty much in, on, on, on a part to how we actually, I would say, most people run and test their networks. Um, so after going through this process, you know, we found some existing open source tools, ran a bunch of tests, identified that actually not only... No, those tools aren't perfect, so we kind of got like some gaps in the tooling, and we've identified a bunch of tests that we didn't think of before, so we now know some extra tests that we'd like to be running. Um, just to go back to what I said previously in this fruit pastel colour scheme, um, we're not anti-vendor, right? I'm not, I'm not like trying to... You know, say anything bad about vendors. Vendors are really important to us. You know, they actually develop the hardware, the software, they train our staff, you know, they fix bugs, you know, all this kind of thing. You know, TAC have got us out of a few sticky situations and sometimes they've added nothing. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to like, you know, speak badly about vendors. They are important to us. The problem is some of them are so closed in their operations, we, you know, as I put at the bottom, we're a total victim to any mistakes they make, you know, almost definitely become our issue. And that's that's pretty crap. So where, where, where are we going with this? Basically, um, we're working on some new features, like I said. So in Etherate, we're working on some features, features to actually introduce packet so, or frame pacing. So instead of just, you know, it's, it's great to blast some traffic as fast <coughs> as you can and test that the performance of the link works as you expected. But how does it actually, how do the stats work when you actually pace the packets out evenly across a time period and this kind of thing? You know, if you put polices on a device um, or ship, schedulers and shapers, you know, how do they work you know, as you pace the traffic out? If I blast, you know, 100 meg interface, I can send 10 megs of traffic in the first tenth of a second, or I can spread it out across the whole second. How does that affect the polices and shapers and your NMS system counting the traffic? And, stuff? and there's other tests that we're working on, so things like uh, the, the Ethernet CRC thing, we're looking at basically generating frames or looking into different kind of frames that would sort of statistically be more likely to trigger or catch CRC errors send them across the network, you know, and have the source and sender detect those uh, bit errors and actually, you know, report on that. 
uh, and, we're, and we're working on some other stuff. One thing I'd really like to point out is actually that, um, so what I'm working on at the minute is, you know, MoonGen and PacketGen is a, is an open source um, DPDK powered testing suites, let's say. Um, and one thing we're working on at the minute is actually writing a whole bunch of Lua scripts to implement RFC 2544 and the ITUTY 1564 testing so that anyone can download them and just do standards-based testing. You know, a major problem that we've got that I actually haven't mentioned yet was that, you know, you can buy testers, you can buy hardware testers, and it's not just the closed source thing, it's actually the cost. You know, a decent tester starts at about two grand and basically the sky's the limit. I can't have one of those, you know, we can't have, you know, dozens of those spread out all across the country, it's just too expensive. And these days, a 10 gig NIC in a server, you know, is, is, um, you know, is basically nothing in the grand scheme of things. So, so we're really looking for, you know, if anyone wants to contribute, there's a GitHub repo, we started putting them up, it's kind of a work in progress, please check out the repo. If anyone wants to donate any hardware, you know, all we need is a server with a 10 or 40 gig NIC in it and remote SSH access so that we can also test the software on more, you know, more hardware and then eventually, so right now we're kind of working on the open source software side of things, but you still need hardware to run it on, so then what we'd like to do is proof a load of different hardware platforms and then have that list for people as well, so you can, you know, instead of spending two grand on a pair of testers, you can just spend one, one grand, you know, on a server with a 10 gig NIC, get the same effect. So that's kind of where we're going, you know, and we want to get to the point where we can test every possibility in the lab, generate every single kind of traffic, every single flow type, measure it, you know, check that it was sent, received, you know, everything. I don't see why we shouldn't be able to do that, basically. Um, you know, and then very, very long-term steps. We're, you know, mo like most people, you're probably looking at software routers. Yeah, we're going to look at basically putting that, that software onto the network devices themselves instead of actually going to places with testers. I don't see why we can't then just move the software onto the network devices. Um, so yeah, I ran through that very quickly, but hopefully that was somebody got some of it. And if you didn't, see me afterwards. Any questions? Are there any questions for James? Uh, there's a lot of hands coming up, so we'll start at the start of the back. Hi, uh, Will Hargrave from Lonap here. Um, interesting presentation. Thank you. It's something I'm interested in a lot. Um, did you do any um, work to when you're testing a link to put some entropy into the frames so that you I'll explain our situation is that for a given uh, two endpoints on LONAP uh, a packet can probably traverse up to 20 different paths depending on its you know actual layer 4 cont traffic uh, layer 4 port info so the work I'm considering is is basically like use a large number of different layer layer 4 ports or, or indeed IPs for testing purposes, so that we make sure that we try and use every moving part. Yeah. So this, so this, I'd say this would be, be quick. Two parts. It's a two-part answer. So we've been focusing on basically Ethernet and MPLS only. So you know, Ethernet, you would expect the switch just to look at the source and destination MAC, and that's it. Um, so obviously, it's it's in our case it's VXLAN, so it's over IP. Yeah. So it's a layer two service, and the layer two service is what we want to measure. But on an underlying base, it transverses can transverse a lot of links. Yeah. So it's, it's, so basically, it is in scope, but for us, just in the future. So yeah, at the minute we haven't looked at that. But you know, stuff like layer two VPNs are bread and butter for that. For us, you know, when you have the same kind of scenario where the devices are looking into the payload and then trying to hash on that, um, so it's kind of on the scope. But we haven't got there yet. I mean, we're looking at, because at the minute I'm focused on stuff like out of order issues for layer two VPNs. But just to kind of not give you a, uh, nothing, let's say, <laughs> actually, there was a guy from Facebook presenting earlier on. Uh, if you don't know it, I can send it to you later on. Facebook have got a tool on GitHub where it basically generates, uh, because this is kind of above the level that we're looking at, you know, layer four, they have a tool that generates loads of different flows. Uh, you have a sender or receiver. Uh, and it will you know, generate a load of different flows on all different port numbers and stuff, so it gets hashed out across all your ECMP links. So they're using that to kind of do a any to any type ECMP check. And it was actually, I think it was at a UK NAR4 links meeting a couple of years ago, they presented it. Um, it's on their GitHub. Yeah, it's a, it's, we haven't got that far, but we're looking there, but only for a lower level. Question over here on, on the right. Hi, Ben from SohoNet. Um, I was wondering, this would make quite a good driver layer for um, running fuzzers against some of your switches, like run something like American Fuzzy Lop or that sort of stuff that will generate patterns 
automatically for testing. Uh, they've done it against bind and that sort of stuff to find weird interactions from different packet types going in. Are you looking at doing any of that sort of stuff? So we, we, we haven't looked in, uh, yeah, we haven't actually looked at fuzzing because, you know, initially I've got like, you know, I've got a sort of well-defined and sort of smaller scope that I need to concentrate on, you know, things that, you know, 99% of our traffic is going to be, like I said, Ethernet and IP and, or MPLS, and it's going to be, you know, between a set, you know, a set of PEs, for example, and, you know, there's quite a little, but long term, you know, that's something we want to look into is basically, so with, with the Lua scripting, that's kind of what we're going for, is you, it'll just be able to generate every single possible frame. So then you just test all, possible, all, all possibilities, you see. That would kind of be the, that's the kind of long term goal. So it, it's a kind of a, a crude fuzzing. It'd be interesting. I mean, yeah. there's lots of stuff that doesn't work that we've found over the years. I agree. Thank you. I've, I've seen there are a couple of other hands, but we, we are running a little behind. So any other questions, please see, see James at lunch. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you very, very much for a fascinating talk about what is in the Kool-Aid that the vendors are selling us. Thank you. Thank you.